Hey everyone, welcome to episode four of our podcast, Over the Hill. Over the Hill is a podcast about our journey to cycling fitness, having started riding five years ago and just getting coached for less than a year. We also have a YouTube channel called Join Jason Rides, which is a visual recap of our races and events. Sometimes we can't really go in depth with our experiences in our videos, so hopefully this podcast can fill the gap. Today, we'll discuss our Vermont Grand Fondo preparation and the actual event itself. Then we'll hop on to some bike mechanic topics and tips for beginners. So sit tight and enjoy the episode. It's been a while since we've recorded a podcast, and we do have a an unfortunate news to share with you before we get started. Uh, Jason will go ahead and talk a little bit about that news. So we recently lost one of our two dogs. Uh, she passed away while we were we were supposed to be on vacation heading down to North Carolina uh, for a uh, a grand fondo in Asheville actually and we were bringing our dogs with us and uh, she passed away in the car ride down yeah so rest in peace our little Maggie we have Rudy with us here love you Maggie so um, we'll just go ahead and get started with the topics so hopefully that didn't start out to be too much of a downer um the last fondo that we did is um, the last fondo that we did was uh, the vermont grand fondo and uh, we're going to talk about our preparation and um, you know leading up to the fondo we did the medial route and just so everybody knows the video is out so we're not going to go into too much details about it because it's mainly already been talked about on the video. So um, what we're going to do is just talk about how we prepped for for this. Well, my preparation was kind of short in terms of training. Coming off of a series of injuries that started at, at Mine Hill and then continued through um, the Highlands Grand Fondo uh, I was still pretty banged up after that. And so I, I think it was two weeks before the, two weeks before the Vermont Grand Fondo that I really started normal training again, uh, had, had one week of, uh, fairly high volume. I think it was about nine hours and then, uh, kind of a taper week, the week of the event. How about you, Joy? What was, what? Oh, um, so uh, I don't remember what I did for preparation. So I should have been more prepared for this because um, I thought you were going to talk about it more. Uh -huh. um, I did a couple of threshold intervals. Um, I think Jason was still trying to recover from his injury from Mine Hill. And so I did um, three by 15 threshold intervals and I did it on... 341, which is this climb. It's like a three to four mile climb. That's probably the more sustained climb around here. We don't, here in Connecticut, we usually, unfortunately do not have long sustained climbs. Uh, so that's the closest that we got for it to it. So um, we did it on 341. If anybody is familiar with that, it's in, in Kent. And I really like that road because um, it's pretty gradual, and there's a st steep part somewhere in the middle of that. Um, and it's also, there's a section where once you ride through it, it's like a wall of oven because uh, it's it's really hot. And I thought maybe it's going to be really hot in Vermont. So I figured riding outside in the heat will help me prepare for for this event. So did a 3 by 15 and then a... I believe a two by 10, um, tapering into the Fondo, um, and a couple of hard rides and, uh, and it's all, you know, I, I've been doing a lot of my rides 
outside because now that I, you know, it's the summer, school's out, and I get more time to be able to, I have more time to be able to do this out, outside. And uh, it's been really, it's been really neat to have to be able to do with us do this outside because I have a hard time riding on the trainer, especially in the summer when I see the sun out peeking through outside. It's like really a tease. So even though it's hot, I do everything I can to ride outside. And I've actually, um, I, I, I mentioned this in previous videos that I do tend to overheat easily. And so I've had some heat mitigation strategies, I call them. And it's mainly just to bring a another water bottle filled with cold water. Um, I have two bottles in my in my in my frame. One is a 950 milliliter bottle and one is a 750. Uh, I can only fit the 750 on the seat tube and not on the down tube because of my frame size. So uh, that's been really helpful training outside in the heat. So if anybody is wondering like what are some of the heat uh, mitigation strategies that people have, it could be it's just, you know, pouring, <laughs> squirting water on the back of my neck and my back and my front to help me kind of uh, to help sort of um, what's that called? manage the heat, manage my body heat. Yeah. So as I mentioned earlier, I wasn't able to really do that much training before Vermont and I wasn't able to do the same workouts that Joy was doing because I was still kind of testing the hip injury at that point um, to see what I could do with without having pain uh, so our coach didn't prescribe me the same workouts as Joy because they were longer intervals and um, I think she was trying to be cautious and, and rightfully so um, trying to ease me back into it to see what I could handle uh, so I did do some threshold intervals but they were shorter and so um, as Joy mentioned, going over to, to 341 to do those hill repeats, I, I did go over there with her, but I just wasn't doing the same workout. Um, so yeah, I um, I didn't get in as much training as I would have liked to, but I guess the I guess I got just enough where I got a little bit of the fitness back and just got the legs, you know, ready to go hard again, and. Um, at the same time, I was still pretty fresh. Uh, so that was a plus. Yeah. Doing these, uh, segment, uh, time segments has been a lot of fun so far because it's almost like treating it like a time trial and the Vermont Fondo was pretty much like an uphill time trial with, a total of 80 miles on your legs. So, uh, yeah, I, I kind of treated it as a time trial, two time trials up the Middlebury and the Brandon Gap. Ooh, did you want to add something? <laughs> um, so we're, we're talking about what happened at the Fondo? Well... I mean, you said you have here good road conditions and scenery, so I'm just... Oh, well, um, I just wanted to... Yeah, so something that I just wanted to mention that we have more details in our video about how exactly our, our ride went on at the Fondo and how what our performance was on, on the segment, so I won't really get into it here, um, but... I just want to mention a takeaway that we had from, uh, or I guess a an impression that that Vermont left on us was there are some really nice roads up there, and if if anyone is has the ability to travel to Vermont to to ride, 
and anyone that lives, especially in northeastern United States, and you have access to to go up to Vermont and and ride some of these these roads or these these uh, mountain gaps. Um, in particular, the the two that we did were Brandon Gap and Middlebury Gap, but there's a couple other ones, you know, Lincoln Gap and Lincoln Gap is supposed to be brutal, but and there's also the uh, I think it's Appalachian Gap. So there's there's a bunch of these um, mountains. I think there's like the Roxbury Gap, Appalachia Gap, and then I think there might be, there's a total of six. Oh, Middlebury. No, we did say Middlebury. Yeah. Uh, whatever. It's, it's There's one more that I keep forgetting what, what that's called. So the... The terrain up there is a bit different from what we have in Connecticut, at least where we live. And I think most of Connecticut is similar to where we live, which is hilly rolling terrain. So we have a lot of short hills and climbs. We don't have too many climbs nearby us that are more than five or 10 minutes long. Um, So it's kind of hard to train for longer efforts um and on our way home from from vermont we were thinking about you know the possibility of going up there to train sometime uh, because it's it's got a great combination of mountain climbs which are can be pretty long and in between the mountains you know in the valley you have roads that are relatively flat you know, maybe some, some mild rolling terrain, but it's, it's pretty flat. So you can, you can do long zone two rides down in the valley and then you can do intervals on the mountains. So it's kind of a nice combination that we don't really have access to at home. Yeah. So Vermont is part of Vermont is, well, I shouldn't say part, probably most of it since it's mountainous, that's where the Appalachian trail runs through which starts so the west coast has the pacific crest trail and we have the appalachian trail on the east coast which runs from maine all the way to georgia or georgia up to maine whichever direction you hike it and so those mountain ranges run through maine vermont new hampshire um, massachusetts and part of it is in connecticut so You do, you know, anybody who's hiked the Appalachian Trail, it runs through parts of Connecticut, and that's where we have that longer sustained climb, which is not as long as, you know, in Vermont, like I said earlier, but it's not, you know, it's not short like most of the hills that we have around here. Uh, So that's why there's these tall uh, mountain ranges. And also... Asheville or part of that North Carolina, which is the North, I would say Western North Carolina is mountainous and that's where Asheville is. And that's where we were supposed to do our Fondo. Um, We actually (laughs) drove through parts of Asheville um, when we were driving down and oh boy, it is nowhere near as close as hilly as it is here. It's actually much more hillier um, so, uh, it's a, it's a too bad that we didn't get to do that Fondo, but you know, for obvious reasons, but anyway, that I kind of went off on a tangent about the Appalachian trail, but any, that's the reason why, um, uh, Vermont has these mountain ranges, but speaking, so with the, which, um, with the mountain ranges, as many of you know, as you go up in elevation, it starts to, it does get cooler and it doesn't help us on that day because unfortunately it was cloudy and rainy. Yeah, so that leads to the next tip, which so- something that I took away from the event is to and learn from it is to always be sure to bring some additional clothing of different varieties with you in the car when you go to an event so that you can gauge what the temperature and conditions are like once you get there and just be prepared 
you know, have a few different options that you can throw on, uh, based on how it, how it's feeling before the event and what the forecast is supposed to be like for the rest of the day. So, uh, in our case, I happened to bring a rain jacket. And so, because it ended up raining all day at the Vermont Fondo, which we weren't expecting, we thought the rain was only going to start in the afternoon. Um, but it was raining, you know, right from, right from the start, it was raining actually before we headed over to the event. So I just threw on the rain jacket and that suited me very well. I just want to say it was nice and sunny the day before, the day we were driving to Vermont. Uh, it was a really nice day. And the day after was, was pretty nice too, driving home. Um, so I think I think Joy forgot her rain jacket, forgot to bring no, it. No, I um, just purposely did not. I don't know. I For some reason, I didn't bother packing it because I was just going to go with my vest and long sleeve uh, arm warmers or arm sleeves, they call them. Which, in, in our case, that probably worked just as well for her as the rain jacket worked for me, honestly, because the rain jacket got soaked. And I, I was still getting wet, even with having... It's not like the rain jacket was keeping me totally dry. So, I guess the point is, as long as you have some sort of extra light some light layers that you can put on top of your jersey that will keep you from freezing when you have cold wet conditions um and you know ideally it would be something that you can easily take off just just in case it does heat up or it stops raining and you know the sun comes out or whatever and you want to change clothes and you have something that's packable yeah i highly recommend for anybody who runs cold, Jason runs cold, and he's always colder than I am. For anyone who runs cold and doesn't have a whole lot of body fat, it's probably a good idea to just pack that, you know, the, the rain jacket or whatever extra layer you have. Like for me, I, I packed the vest to keep your core temperature warm. I know there's a guy that we know who did the century uh, route. Um, and he pulled out at mile 80. He had already done, I'm not sure if he'd already done four gaps, um, but he had to pull out because he was, he just had a short sleeve jersey on and shorts. Um, and he was, he said he was shivering um, at the one at the last rest stop. And he eventually just said, uh, screw it, just take me back to the, uh, you know, to the finish line. And, and he said he couldn't, he was in the car shivering, waiting to warm up in the mechanics car. That's how cold he was. Yeah. So it can, it can get pretty serious with your potential hypothermia. So just make sure that you avoid any major issues and um, especially if you run cold, but even if you don't run cold, it doesn't hurt to bringing like a light vest that's easily packable You know, it doesn't add much weight or bulk to you. It's, it's probably worth having on hand if, if the weather is iffy, um, you know, better safe than sorry. So do you think that you needed more layers or do you think that was enough? Um... For most of the ride, it was enough. It was, there was only a couple of times when I started shivering. One was at the top of um, the first gravel section had a climb. And when we got to the top of that, I was starting to feel kind of hot with the rain jacket. So I took it off. And then, of course, I started freezing on that descent. And so I put the jacket back on and then I said, for the rest of the day, I'm just going to leave it on because I don't want to, you know, deal with with getting cold again. Just for reference, I think it was around 55 degrees. So it's not, it wasn't freezing out there. I think it's just freezing because you run cold, but it was not freezing at, 
um, at the time when we were riding. Right. I mean, I think it's a combination of that I run cold and then also... It was raining. It's, it rain, it's raining and so... And you don't like riding in the rain. <laughs> and when... Well, I don't know who does like riding in the rain, but... Um, but anyway, you know, when, when you go down a, a descent and it's cool and, and rainy and you're, you know, you were sweating going up the climb, you're just going to start getting cold. Um, and, you know, maybe Joy didn't get cold because she was, she had her vest, but. Yeah, I, um, I'm not sure if, well, I, I did take it off on the second segment, but. I kept it on, I think, for the most part throughout the ride because I know my core runs cold. I'm such a wuss when it's cold. Like I, I, when I first ride out there, I'm always like shivering. And so I kept the vest on and the arm sleeves on. I figured the arm sleeves were not, I mean, the vest, they, were, they weren't waterproof, but I didn't mind getting wet. I just, it was just a cold that bothered me. But once it gets started, once I started moving, it wasn't, it was not, um, it wasn't a problem. Like once I started climbing, that was not the case. It was just the descending portion of the entire ride for me, at least that made it cold. And of course I punctured on the last, at the last, before the last rest stop, I punctured on one of the gravel sectors, which was really annoying. Um, and so we got to the rest stop. I figured like, I mean, we just keep riding because we have the Silka sealant in there and it's been really, it's in the past has been pretty good. But I think part of that was my fault. I didn't change my front tire. I changed my rear tire, but I didn't replace my front tire before we did the event. And I thought, there's a little indicator in the tires. You could tell whether how much how much it's worn, and um, it looks like a little dimple. And when the dimp when you can't see the dimple anymore, that means it's fairly worn. And when I checked mine, I could see the dimple still. So what I did was I just cleaned the um, the tire and put new sealant in the in the rims and uh, or sorry, put the new sealant in the tires. And uh, just went by that. And, and of course, my front tire got a puncture and I had a feeling and that was my fault. So I um, we stopped at the last rest stop and I tried to plug it using this, um, you know, using I was going to try to plug it using these like little bacon strips. But I made it worse because I, I was supposed to poke a hole through it, which I did. But then it let all the air out. And I tried putting the bacon strip in there and it wouldn't stay on. And I probably did it wrong. So I, I think what I'm going to do is try to like practice doing that next time. But it, it wouldn't stay in. I, I wasted like two little bacon strips. And then finally I said, screw it. We're just, I'm just going to put a tube in there. And I tried to remove the, um, the tubeless valve, but I couldn't. And I got Jason to try and he couldn't do it also. Finally, we found a mechanic that was able to use like a like pliers or whatever to just um, loosen it and remove it. And uh, I kept the tubeless valve because we have these um, Fillmore valves, which is, I, I really like those valves. And um, anyway, put the tube in uh, and was good to go. He... Um, so yeah, so we, we did that. And then when we got back home the next day or a few days later, I wanted to put sealant. I wanted to remove the tube that was in there and replace the tire because I, you know, I had a tire that was already, I set aside brand new tire. So I installed a new tire on there and um, I found out that the lock ring, the reason why it wouldn't loosen was because it was all like the dirt from the gravel sectors it was all like gunked up and like built up in the uh, threads. So that's why we couldn't unscrew it. So yeah, so we spent some time at that rest stop trying to figure out what was wrong with it. And because we kind of were kind of sitting around for a while, 
Um, eventually we started to get cold and we were like shivering and like, let's get the heck out of here. Um, and, uh, yeah, Jason decided to do the pulling for the last 20 miles because he said, you know, he, you can tell the story why. Well, yeah, I was getting, I was really cold and, um, just wanted to finish. Um, and like you said, like you couldn't really steer, right? Because it was, I was like shaking cause I was shivering so much. Um, I, I should mention that this last 20 miles of the ride, it was also the worst weather of the day at that point. It was, um, you know, not only the rain was harder, but it was also really windy. There, there were some wind gusts that were hitting us on the way back and we were, we were in the valley, so we were more exposed. We were supposed to have a tailwind. I, I don't know if we did have a tailwind. It didn't feel like a tailwind. It felt because the gusts were, uh, I don't know, I don't know what direction. I'm pretty sure it said on Epic Ride Weather it was a tailwind, but it felt like more of like a crosswind with the, with the gust. Yeah. And so I wanted to do te some tempo just to, to try to get my body heat up because I felt like if, I needed to do something to warm up and that it was actually pretty effective. Um, you know, after doing that for five or 10 minutes, I stopped shivering. And then, you know, I said, I'm just going to keep doing tempo the rest of the way because I don't want to start shivering again. Yeah. The, the worst part about being in the back is that I kept getting pelted by water and I don't know if it was rain or if it was the spray from the Jason's tires being in the back it's like even though i we had our clear glasses on and i had you know it was i thought it was enough to protect me um and i like the clear glasses on the and the when it's cloudy out because i could still see i like to be able to to see clearly where i'm going and i couldn't see because i was being pelted by rain and water from jason's rear tire and i was convinced after that that i was going to get for some reason, it was only in my right eye, too. And I was convinced that I was going to get pink eye because of how red my eyes were after that. Um, yeah, so I couldn't, I'm not sure, maybe it was the direction of the rain, how the rain was, the raindrops were hitting my face. But it was like I had to squint my right eye and pretty much ride with my left eye open, barely open. I just used Jason's rear lights as a guide is like a beacon of like where what direction I'm going I mean I could see him but it was just really hard with the rain being pelted by rain so since these the segments were both uphill um yeah I pretty much just treated that as a seg as a time trial and I've learned to I wish that there was an easier way that Wahoo can somehow make it simpler to adjust your screen without having to, there's kind of, I find it a little cumbersome to do that each time when I adjust my screen because I, then I forget like, oh, what was my original screen? Um, so I wish that there was a way that Wahoo can make it a little bit easier to adjust screen on the fly or just adjust screen like before the day before a race because I, I have to kind of basically think about what do I want on my on my Wahoo screen so um, what I wound up doing was on so there's the main screen where I see everything and then there's the navigation screen which shows the map and then there's the climb port like the climb what do they call it? Climb segments? What do they call that? I was to say climb portal, but that's Swift. Yeah. The um, w summit segments, that's what it is. Yeah. So which has the, it's, you could see the climb. Uh, so within that, there's the elevation screen. So from there, this might get a little too technical, but um, from there, I did the watts, three second, average three second power, I did the lap distance because I knew in the back of my mind, since there were only two segments, I knew the two segments, the distance of the two segments. 
and the lap time along with the elevation profile. Um, so we have the element bolt and it shows you in color like how steep the gradients are. So it was nice. It's good to be able to see that because then I can anticipate, oh, this is going to be a steeper part of the climb. Um, so that's pretty much what I had on my screen. And I know sometimes if you're, I mean, if you're really, if you're a little serious about doing well in these events and you're wondering how, you know, what would be the best thing to look at on the screen, I would say if it's a, like a climbing segment, I would say do something like that. Definitely have the distance because a lot of these fondos, it will tell you how long the segment is and um, your, your power just so that you can gauge your effort that way. I don't know so much about the time. I guess the time was kind of like a, um, was sort of a bonus thing that I wanted to, I had there just so I had an idea of what my, my time was for that segment. Um, and oh yeah, the, the gear selection, if you have electronic shifting, um, you could see the gears. I like to have that on hand all the time. How about, did you do anything special with your screens? I actually didn't change them from what they normally are for and it's because of the same reason that you mentioned like it's kind of cumbersome to to keep switching your screens um you know through the wahoo app and it would be nice if they had the ability to like save sa it save a couple different versions yeah so that you could say like okay this is my segment whenever I do a segment race, I'm going to do this version. And for a regular ride, I'm going to do this version and just save a few, a few different versions ahead of time so that you can just easily toggle between one or one to the other. So because it's a little cumbersome to change all of your screens and then try to remember the way it used to be before you change them, I just left them the way they normally are. And I believe for most of the ride, I just had the the map um, screen with the directions. And then when we hit the segments, I just hit the lap button and used my, my normal lap screen that I use for all my workouts, which I believe has the three second power, average power for the whole lap. Um, I, th I think distance for the whole lap time for the whole lap uh cadence heart rate which i don't really i don't really look at those that much the, the main thing that i focus on is is the power that i'm doing you know at that moment you know the three second average and then once in a while i'll look at my average power just to make sure that i'm not like overcooking myself or something and and then the for a segment race the other thing that was important to me was the the distance that i've covered for that lap because that that because we we knew how long the segments were going into going into it so you know for example um you know the first segment middlebury gap we knew it's about two miles so if i look down in my screen and i see that i have you know one mile completed for the lap I know I have that I'm halfway and I have you know one more mile to go so so yeah I didn't I basically didn't change anything from what I normally use on my Wahoo and I would suggest if you are going to change your screen I wouldn't do it the night before so that you you know just because you you are used to the screens that you have that you've been riding with and so probably train with that so that you have some idea of how, what to look for. Um, I know in the past when I would change my screens, I'd forget like, where's my gear selection or where's my heart rate or where is the grade? Um, so I would say train, if you're going to ch change your screen, I would say just train with that. And um, yeah, that way you're used to it and you're not having to like go through the pages to figure out where you, you have it. So overall, it was a, a good experience, right? I think it was a good experience. 
Um, I I can't really say much about the aid station since we we only went to two of them, and uh, super helpful. Okay, I never thought I'd use the SAG support for mechanic uh, mechanicals, but. Yeah, super helpful. If it weren't for them, then I wouldn't have finished it. I was so disappointed though when I got the flag. I was like, I can't stop. I only have we only had twenty minute, uh, twenty miles. So, um, so I, I really think it could have been better if the weather was better. Uh, they had food. They served food there, but we didn't really get to to eat there because we were just we actually didn't. We got an Airbnb not far from the start, so we were only like five, ten minutes away. So figured, uh, let's just go home and uh, wash up because um, my eye was, my right eye was bothering me, and I just wanted to get the heck out of my bib shorts. And my hair was all like, I don't know. It felt a little. It felt gross being wet in the rain with, um, with dirt. Like I found like gravel dirt in my ears. <laughs> So, um, I think it would have been a better experience had it not rained, but it's not, you know, nothing against the organizer because nobody has control over the, the weather. And unfortunately, I think there's, that's also the reason why a lot of people did not finish it or didn't bother starting it because of the weather. It, I mean, it wasn't from the videos. I think I, I showed a little bit more. I didn't think it looked that awful. As if you're dressed appropriately, I think you definitely could have finished it. And if you trained, you know, you could have definitely finished it. It was not an issue at all to to finish the medial route because most of it was like flattish rolling, and then there was the two big climbs. Um, um, there was something else I wanted to to say um, about it, but now I can't remember. Um, but anyway, yeah, I thought it was a good experience. Definitely going to go back. Um, I don't know if we're going to go back next year, but I definitely like to try that and do the 100 mile ride, which is the four gaps. Um, so if we're brave enough to do that. Oh, yeah, that's what I was going to mention. Uh, yeah, we both got second our age group. Jason got, what did you get for in the men's field? Eighth? Eighth overall for the Medio. Yeah, eighth route. in the men's field. And then I got sixth in the women's field. And then overall in the Medio route, you got eighth. And I got 18th out of 92 participants, which I'll take. I'll take top 20 Uh and Jason got top 10. So that's pretty good. And I'm pretty happy with, I was, it's funny because every time we do these events, I'm, there's always something to complain about after, after it. And my, our coach would text us like, Oh, how did it go? And I would like say all the, <laughs> all my complaints and she just, you know, I'm glad that she can t take my complaints and just <laughs> go one ear out the other. Um, but yeah, overall, um, I definitely think it was it was a lot of fun and really happy with uh, with my performance. Yeah, same here. Um, happy with the performance. Definitely the best result that I've had in in a segment race by far, and uh, so no complaints there. It was better than than I expected. Um, the the event itself, I think it's a I think it's a really good event. It's a, I think the route, the route was fun or, you know, would have, it was, it was still a pretty fun route, even with the bad weather. Um, I have to say I enjoyed, I would say I enjoyed at least the first half of the route when the weather wasn't too bad. You know, it was just kind of light rain. Um, it, you know, when I say at the end, I, you know, that I wasn't having any fun and I just wanted to finish. I mean, that was, that was kind of the dark spot of the day. It was those last 20 miles when, you know, there were getting pelted by rain and there's wind gusts and, you know, we're really cold and everything. But, you know, that's, 
that's beyond the control of the event. You know, that could have happened anywhere. I I think from from what we saw uh, of the roads and and the route, it was you know a well put together route. The roads are great, um, in good condition for the most part, and um, the the gravel sectors. I I'm a little iffy on the gravel sectors just because of what happened to Joy with her puncture, um, which kind of compounded the issues we were having with the weather. Um, but the gravel that they, that they had actually wasn't too, it wasn't too chunky. And, and, um, that's why it's kind of annoying that Joy got the puncture because the gravel was, if you were to ride that with a gravel bike, it would have been, you know, pretty darn smooth. Um, but even with a road bike, it was pretty rideable. Um, well, very rideable. Uh, so it's I'm, a little sketchy when it's raining. Yeah, on the road, but on the road tires. Yeah, you just have to be careful. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think we would have had, we would have had a lot more fun if it was nice weather, but still had a still had fun for most of the ride, even with the bad weather. So that just tells you, you know, that it's, you know, it's a, a good event and a good route. And uh, yeah, I definitely want to to go back there and, and do it again. Um, like Joy said, probably doing the century ride next time. And the main thing I'm looking forward to with doing that event again, which we missed out on this time around was the scenery. Um, there were moments where we were able to take in the scenery, but there were also moments where, we were kind of heads down, you know, just focused on the road in front of us and, you know, weren't really in a position to be looking around at the mountains. But when we drove home the, the day after the event, um, we ro- we drove on some of the same roads that we had ridden on and um, you, could, you could see the mountains, you know, to either side of you and it was just really pretty. And so I think we would have had just that much more fun if the weather was was nice yeah we were thinking about for next year this is up in the air but to stay there for a month um you know near probably lake champlain because to you know right by the water um flat and then ride out into the uh the gaps so yeah i i in hindsight looking back on it now i wish that we were there for longer just to experience what riding in Vermont is like since that was, that's actually the second time that I've been to Vermont. Um, So I don't always go to Vermont and I'm sorry if you can hear (laughs) crinkling in the background. Our dog Rudy is just busy with his new toy. Um, So if you can hear that and hear snorts, it's because of Rudy and the squeaks. It's his new toy. So yeah, hopefully next year, Maybe spend some time, oh my gosh, Rudy. maybe spend some time in Vermont and just do some riding there. So speaking of mechanicals, which I had, um, so between the two of us, one is the more at-home bike mechanic, and what would you call the other one? Well, you're the at-home bike mechanic. I'm like the tire pumper guy. <laughs> Jason is the pre-ride the pre- checker. Pre-ride, pre-ride bike checker. <laughs> I I pump the tires, make sure the uh, you know that there's batteries in the the shifters, and uh, you know that the shifting. Do a quick check on the shifting to make sure that like everything's pedals are, functional. are charged. Yeah, pedals are charged. All the you know the. The most basic stuff is that's pretty much all I can handle. But the most basic stuff is what I forget to do because I'm relying on Jason so much to do it that even like one time on a ride that I did, I didn't bother checking any of those things and I'm riding and I'm feeling, oh, why, why is my, why do I feel squishy? Like, why is my rear tire squishy? And I remember I stopped and I checked and I was, I had a, it was completely out of air. It wasn't a flat, but it was uh the tires didn't have air and I didn't, um, 
I didn't pump air in it. Well, so the question is, why didn't I pump air in it that day? That was a I don't remember. I think you had to work and oh, yeah, I'm not sure what the reason was. As, I actually take that as a failure on my part. If you <laughs> if you go out for a ride and something's wrong with the bike, because usually even if we don't ride together, um, you know, I still do the bike check on both our bikes. Um, so we're going to talk about, we're going to have a little segment on at home bike mechanics. And I grew up just a little background. I grew up, my dad is a mechanic and I grew up watching him tinker with things in the garage. And I somehow, I guess, uh, inherited that skill from him. He's not a bike mechanic but I inherited the skill of tinkering with things. And it's like one little thing led to another. And I started to get, I think, you know, pretty decent with bike mechanics. And so just a few, I was listening to a podcast, the Chris Miller, the Nero podcast, Chris Miller podcast, two Aussie guys, Chris Miller and, and Jesse Coyle, and they were talking about some bike mechanic stuff. And he talks and Chris, said that he doesn't even he's afraid to touch the derailleur hanger he's like he's not even going to go near it um, and if any one of you don't know what the derailleur hanger is it's p- pretty much this little piece of gadget that connects t- to your frame and your derailleur which is a little important l- small piece because um, and the reason for that is in case you crash your frame, your entire frame doesn't crash your, your, you don't damage your rear derailleur. And the only thing that gets damaged, hopefully it's the only thing that gets damaged is the derailleur hanger. And most cases, um, I'm going to use Jason as an example when he crashed or when he crashes in previous times, it's almost always, if you have bad shifting after a crash, it's because it could be your derailleur hanger that's bent. So I'm going to talk about some simple ways to fix bad shifting. And I am only going to talk about, sorry, SRAM, electronic shifting, and also some mechanical shifting, but I'm not, you know, I, it's been a while since I've, we've had a mechanical shifting, um, bike. Uh, so what I found really easy with SRAM is this micro adjust feature that they have in case your shifting kind of goes off whack for whatever reason. And, or when you're riding and you notice that the chain is skipping, it could possibly be that your, your, you could, you adjust your micro adjust your micro shifting. So that could be the reason. It could also mean that your um, chain might be worn down or it might need to, and it might need to be replaced, but look at the micro shifting first before you do all that, because it could just be that simple fix. And to do that is there are two ways to do it. You can do it on the app. And I think that's pretty handy so that you can actually see how much the derailleur is moving inwards or outwards, depending on how you want to align the, um, the chain with the individual, with the teeth, uh, the teeth of the cogs. So doing it with the app is probably the simplest, one of the simpler ways. But if you're on the go, like in the middle of a ride and you just want to fix it without having to pull up the app and, and pair the uh, shifters with your phone, um, there's a little button in both of the, at least with the road bikes, uh, on the inside of the shifter, there's these buttons and you hold that button and shift. So let's say you want the uh, the railier to move inward a little bit, it's going to shift it in m- millimeters and it's a very small movement. So you can barely see it, but that's why you have to kind of, you know, uh, spin the pedals to see, uh, or turn the cranks to see if it's doing anything. 
So you would press, if you want to move the derailleur inwards, you would press this little button in the, sh in the left shifter, uh, hold that and then press in to shift. And you're going to spin the cranks and press it again to see if you hear any of that clicking sound. And that should, if it's a minor thing as that, that should be able to, to fix the problem. Uh, so I would consider that micro adjusting, I would sh say is probably the easiest way to fix bad shifting. But then if it's something else like your derailleur, your limit screws may not be set properly uh, and your B screws are not set properly, that's the next step. And I would consider that to be an intermediate to hard. Uh, and SRAM is really good because they have videos out there to show you how to do it. And if you just search um, SRAM access adjust limit screws, you know, that video will pop up. So they have like a library of different videos just on that particular issue. Um, so in limit screws are not just a SRAM thing. It's all bikes, all derailleurs have limit screws, all derailleurs have B screws. And so just check to make sure that you've adjusted your high and low limit screws and your B screws adjusted properly. And the B screw is just to help, um, with the, the tension and the distance. And you can usually see that by, um, using the, uh, the cogs aligning it with the cassette. And, uh, there's a certain distance that you have in order for it to maximize your shifting. But again, I would suggest watching that video, um, that SRAM has on their YouTube channel and go with that. And the next thing is, um, adjusting the derailleur hanger. Again, most people probably don't are afraid to touch the derailleur hanger because you don't want to snap it. There is this website called derailleurhanger.com and you put in, they have all makes and models and you put in your, the, the, the brand of bike that you have and its model and it'll spit out the derailleur hanger. And I would suggest probably removing your derailleur hanger and kind of holding it up on the screen to make sure it matches. And you can purchase a new derailleur hanger from them. It depending on, I guess what brand it is, um, it's between 30 to $50. Um, but I would suggest like getting a couple, especially if you're prone to, uh, crashing, and all that, just get a few so that you have that on hand. That way you don't have to, you know, you don't crash one day, snap your derailleur hanger and you wait a week or so for it to get shipped to you, uh, for to get the, the, the uh, replacement shipped to you. Um, so with a derailleur hanger, you do need this tool. It's called Derailleur Hanger Adjuster and Park Tool makes it. It's, uh, it's D-A-G. Um, and I think it's, there's, there's a few iterations of it. Um, I think I have the park tool DAG two, um, and it's so easy to adjust your derailleur hanger. Um, and you pretty much have to bend or bend your derailleur hanger. So it restraightens out. So you attach this tool to it. Um, there's a great video by Shane Miller, GP Lama, who demonstrates how to use this tool. And what you're doing is you're realigning your derailleur hanger. You have to unscrew your, de your derailleur and, uh, just realigning the hanger itself. And from the time that I've done it, right. Would you agree that it's worked? Yeah. It's fixed the problem. Yeah. Um, joy just did that f for my bike, uh, recently. And, um, and yeah, it, it was much better. The shifting was much better afterward. And you're pretty good at being able to tell whether the derailleur hanger is bent, but yeah, you could, you should, you could eyeball if you stand behind your bike, if you put it on a, um, a bike stand, um, or a repair stand, I mean, and just look from behind, you can tell whether or not your derailleur is, is 
bent in words. It's mo- most of the time it'll be bent in words because if you crash onto something or, you know, if you crash in general, you're going to bend your derailleur in words. So yeah, the purpose of that is just to pretty much, you know, hopefully minimize the damage on your derailleur hanger or sorry, minimize the, de- the, the damage on your frame and your rear derailleur itself. Um, before we go on to the next thing question, um, I believe, tell me if I'm wrong, I believe that once you bend the derailleur hanger to, you know, adjust it, um, there's like a limit to how many times you can do that before you have to replace it, right? Yeah, I think they say, I think bike shops recommend only doing it one time. So that means you're only um, readjusting the or realigning your derailleur hanger once because when you do it more than once, it actually compromises the integrity of the metal and it'll weaken it. And so if you do um, crash next time, it might actually snap. So yeah, so if you use a derailleur hanger alignment tool once on a derailleur hanger, just do that once. And then after that, I would say if you crash again, replace the derailleur hanger entirely. You have any other questions? Uh, No, that's, that's it for that one. Um, So I think I touched on this a little bit about replacing tires. And um, I mentioned how, um, how to tell when your tire is starting to wear down. Usually when you start to see cracks on there, Um, we use the Continental GP 5000s. And supposedly the reason why it's 5000 is supposed to last 5000 miles. But that's obviously all based on the conditions that you're riding in. So if you're, you know, we have potholes here, we have cracks in the road, um, the conditions of the road are not pristine here in Connecticut. So we do ride on some pretty tough pavement, rough pavement. So I would say really, I mean, don't go by, oh, I only, I've only ridden this tire for 2,500 miles. Go by what it you know just look at the tire itself you know if there's that little dimple which is supposed to show you how worn it is check to see if you could see it if you can't see it you have to replace it and then check to see if there are any cracks on the tires Um, and then if you're getting multiple punctures on that tire it's i think it should be time for you to to replace that tire we get like very (laughs) um I guess, anal retentive when it comes to punctures. As soon as we get a puncture on a tire, we're like, okay, that's it. We're replacing it because I don't want to have to fix this again next time. Um, so that's pretty much why you would replace. That's the reason why you would replace a tire. And obviously, if you like the tire, don't you know go replacing it just because I said so. Just look for those things. Um, or if you want a different type of tires, um, then, you know, that's the reason why you would want to replace it. But for practical standpoint, you know, replace it when it's old, when you have multiple flats on it, um, and all that. So I think Rudy agrees with me. Tubes, when you're in the middle of the road and you get, um, a puncture, Tubes are probably the easiest way. If you have sealant, um, if it's dry conditions, usually our sealant works well in dry conditions. We have the silica sealant in our tires. Usually that works well, but then there are times when it won't seal it for whatever reason. It could be just the size of the puncture, whatever reason, or the the sealant has dried, um, you know, then it won't seal properly. So you'd have to pretty much replace it with a tube. And, And installing a tube is easier um, I think then, then tubeless, if you've never set up tires tubeless before, it is a learning curve. So just a heads up and I've spent hours learning how to seat tires. So tubes are the easiest and, you know, there are three tubes, three different types of tubes available. You can have the butyl tubes, which are the dark, the black rubber ones. You have the latex tubes, 
which Vittoria makes. And you have the TPU tubes, which are the plastic tubes that are new out there, which is the lightest. Um, we carry the Vittoria latex inner tubes because they are lighter and they're also lower rolling resistance than the butyl tubes and I'm not sure about the TPU tubes. So we have that, you know, we, we roll, we use those tubes, um, when we have to replace a tire in the middle of, you know, when we can't, we don't have sag support or anything in the middle of a ride. Um, but go with the tubes that you prefer. I mean, the butyl tubes are the cheapest, but you know, they're also pretty heavy. So you can, you can only carry one on you. Um, the lightest, the TPU tubes, which are, I'm going to say they're new because I've only seen them out. I think starting last year, we have TPU tubes for our gravel bike and our mountain bike. I mean, we've never used it, but they're there. Um, so not sure of how, um, how good the TPU tubes are. I, though I've read that some mixed reviews on them that they don't, they're not very durable. Um, I don't know. I've never done, I've never actually fitted a tire with TPU tubes. So I cannot say for sure how durable they are, but they are super light. I think they're lighter than the latex tubes. Uh, so if you're daring and if you're doing like a hill climb time trial or something, and if you want to use that and, uh, <laughs> go, go for that. Um, any questions about tubes replacing? No, I mean, the replacing a tube is probably the one, uh, it, that's really a basic for me, that's an intermediate skill, but for most people, it's probably a basic skill, but that's probably, you know, that's one of the few things that, that I'm, that I've done before, um, that I would feel confident enough doing if I was, you know, out on the road by myself and I got a flat. So tubeless, um, I think some people are you know, iffy about using tubeless on road bikes. Um, we've converted to tubeless because the tire wheel combination actually makes it easy. So if you want to convert to tubeless, you have to just, there's a couple of things that you have to know about your setup. So first off is your wheel, are your wheels tubeless compatible? So that's the first thing. So you need to have, you need to check that. If they're old wheels, they probably aren't, but I think there are some hacks that people do to make their old wheels tubeless. Um, and I've never done that because we have tubeless compatible wheels. And make sure if you do have tubeless compatible wheels, make sure the tires are compatible with those wheels. When we first got our Fazari, um, it was, it has right now, um, the zip 303S wheels with the Conti 5000 tires in them. But before we, before I changed them out to Conti's, they had the Maxxis high road tires and they were already set up tubeless, which was great. But then I wanted to change, it was starting to, the tires were starting to wear out. So I wanted to change the tires or I wanted to, I'm sorry. I wanted to add more sealant to the tires. So I remembered I, you know, I removed the tire, added sealant, and then we have an air compressor. So I pumped the air um, and the tire itself had a hard time seating, actually it wouldn't seat at all. And I couldn't figure out what the issue was. And um, I actually finally got it to see because I watched a bunch of videos and one of the videos which I found helpful was to use an old inner tube and to wrap that inner tube around the tire so that there's a lot of tension which pushes that tire down. So when you pump it with air, um, no, the air would not leave the tire as you're pumping it in as you're pumping it and it'll seed it. So it worked once. And then the second time I did it, it did not work. So I was like working on this tire for a number of hours. And finally Jason brought it to the bike shop 
And they said, oh, yeah, those tires are not compatible with those wheels. And so um, that was many hours wasted in my part. Uh, so, yeah, just check to make sure that your tires are compatible with the wheels because it seats so easily if you if they are compatible. At least the, the Conti GP5000s that we have, um, they are so easy to seat with the, the Zip 303S and never have a never had a problem with 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 them. Um, when you do have all that set up and you want to remove the tire, make sure you're using good tire levers. Um, it is easy to ruin your wheels and also um, damage your rim tape if you're using poor quality tire levers. And it makes the job a lot longer if you're using um, bad quality tire levers. Uh, we have Gorilla tire levers, I think they're called. We have um, Pedro's tire levers and we also got Silka. So those are all pretty good and they were sent to us. Um, I think it was free because we ordered something and it, you know how when you order a certain amount, you get something for free. So that's the reason why we have those different tire levers. Um, but I bought the one, the Gorilla one at Amazon, from Amazon. And uh, all of those work well. And so once you get the, the tire removed, you want to clean the rim, uh, the wheel itself. So make sure that there's no extra sealant in there and then clean the tires also because you might have dried up sealant. Um, having wet sealant, it actually is a lot easier to, to just wipe that down, but it's dry. I find it satisfying to peel off the dried sealant, but I know most people probably don't have the time that I have in the summer. So um, if it is dry, then you do have to spend some time peeling the dried sealant off the tire. And then, um, yeah, install the new tire and make sure that it's facing in the correct direction. So the Contis have these like shark fin looking design or pattern on the tires. So make sure that the pattern is, the shark fin is facing forward instead of backwards. So just make sure that the orientation of the tire is um, correct before you actually fully install it. And this is a tip that maybe some of you know, uh, or most of you know, but I'm just gonna say it anyway. When you're installing the tire, leave about 10 inches from the valve unseated. So leave it just the way it is so that it's easier for you to pour the sealant in and then you can install it fully. And then what I do is, is I, um, I rotate the wheel so that the valve is at the 12 o'clock position. And that's where I, you know, use the air compressor to pump air in. And the reason for that is because when it's in a 12 o'clock position, the sealant is in the six o'clock position at the bottom. So when you pump air in there, you're not going to get, uh, you know, you're not going to get all this sealant mess all over the place uh, because the valve is far away from where the sealant actually is. Uh, yeah, so I already have those tools, like I have an air compressor. So and that this was from like previous home projects. So we already have that. Um, but I would suggest getting an air compressor and they do make small ones. Um, so, yeah. It's pretty hard to, to seat the tire without an air compressor, right? Yeah, they have, they have like, um, they do have pumps where, um, I forget what they're called, but you pump air into this, like, oh, they call them shock pumps. So you pump air. Um, you have to have a lot of strength for it too, though, because especially if you want to, it, you want to have like 150 PSI of air pushed out, like you need to have a lot of air in that canister. So yeah, I would suggest an air compressor tool would be the best and easiest way to go about it. Um, that's just because we already have it on hand. I think the other methods, you know, if you are strong enough to pump that much air. I, I'm not. Um, 
it's a little bit more time consuming, I think, if you if you use a shock pump, but I've never used one, so I don't know. I maybe I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> uh, do you have any questions for me about that? Because I'm sure whatever questions you have, other people might have that question. And I'm proud to say that I do this without gloves. <laughs> I prefer not to use gloves because it depends on what it is. Um, just because sometimes my hair gets in the way and I just need, I can't be white, you know, pushing my hair back with, um, with a dirty gloves, get stuff in my hair. Oh, well, one, one thing that I think we've done in the past when the tire, we may not have had to do it with the continental tires on the road bike, but I don't know if it was with the gravel bike or, I think there was a, a time that I remembered trying to help you with this process and a tire wasn't still wasn't seating with the air compressor and I think the remedy was to use like soapy water. Oh around yeah. The, Most likely the mountain bike tire is probably Yeah, it might have been the mountain bike. Just because the mountain bike tires are just so um it are for me, I, I use special gloves for that with like, I have like rubber gloves, um, or the palms have rubber in them just because I don't have a, a strong, as strong of a grip, but it does require strength when you're trying to work with mountain bike tires, especially if they're new. And, uh, yeah, so they may have a difficult time, uh, seating, based whether or not if it's a new tire or not but yeah soapy water um so what's that part of the tire called the that sort of edge of the tire that goes um like inside of the rim uh what do you call i think that? it's called a, I, I think it's called a rim bed okay but there's this like a way for you to tell whether or not it's the tire is seated is there's this um almost like i don't want to say layer but there's like an indentation along the side of the tires and it's supposed to help tell you whether or not this tire has seated. Um, it's almost like a line. Like if you mm -hmm. were to draw like, so you have the circle, circular shape of the rim and then like really close to the rim on the tire. Um, you know, if you're looking at the, the wheel from the side, you see the circle of the, the rim and then just above that, if the tire is seated, you'll see like another line slash circle going around. Um, so you should see that should be like even all the way around. Like if, if you see that part of that, that circle that's on the, the side of the tire, if part of it's like covered up by the, the rim and it's not showing, then it means that it's not seated. Yeah. Sometimes, um, another, a, a way to, instead of soapy water is just by riding it a little bit, that'll seat the tire and spit. Spit actually is a good lubricant to, um, you know, to lubricate that inner part of the tire and to help it seat. So if you don't have, you know, if you're in the middle of nowhere and you have a hard time seating the tire, then that could be an option. I guess that concludes the at-home bike mechanics. And if you guys have any questions about, oops, if you guys have any questions about anything, uh, I would suggest going into YouTube, but you have to be very specific. Or you can email us, us email us at joyandjasonrides at gmail.com. I think that's our, that's our, that's a new email address. So I'm pretty sure that's the correct email address. All right. Last segment. Yeah. So some tips for beginners. Um, if any of you are looking to do any of these uh, hill climb time trials, very climby uh, events or lots of climbing, um, what can we do? Well, one of the what I think is the, the biggest, I don't know if it's mistakes, but just an issue that a lot of 
people have. Um, you know, if you're a really strong rider, this may it you can probably get away with with a lot a lot lower gearing. Or I mean, I, I mean, I'm sorry, a lot like higher higher gearing. But uh, something that we come across often is when we do these events is you see someone really struggling on a, a climb and sometimes walking it and they're like really grinding. And then you look at their cassette and it's like pretty small, you know, it's like a, just your standard. It's probably the standard cassette that comes with a road bike, which might be, um, you know, either a 28 or, or these days, maybe like a, you know, a 30 or 32 or something like that. But I mean, if you're doing steep climbs and you're not a super strong rider, it it's really helpful to have a bigger cassette. Uh, it's not just a bigger cassette. I think it's also the gear ratio. That's I right. Think what it's a combination should... of chainring and cassette. Right. We met this guy at Vermont. Right. We were talking to him. I forget his name. Nice guy. We were talking about. Um, just how hard the event's going to be with the climbs and everything. And he was saying that he um, had a 39 chain ring and a, I think a 33 cassette or 32 largest cog in the back. So 32, so a 39, 32. Um, so, and I must, I don't know, you know, just, I'm just going to go by, it's probably not the best way to gauge somebody's fitness, but he's like an older gentleman. You know, he, he was, he was already concerned about the climbs and he, he told us his, his gear ratio. And, um, you know, so that could, so if you have that combination of gearing that could potentially lead you to grinding, um, up on those climbs. So if it's less than a one-to-one -one ratio, you're going to guarantee that you are, probably going to be grinding depending on what type of power you're putting out. Um, and if you're amateurs like us, you know, we prefer to have lower gearing just so we could get the cadence up higher. Uh, it, depending on if it's a too steep of a climb, you're not going to be doing 100 RPMs unless you're doing like 500 watts. Um, but yeah, just the gear ratio, you know, to prevent yourself from from using too much of your muscles and also ease the pain from ease the burden from your knees. Yeah. Um, so having lower gearing helps with, it helps with two things. When you're on a moderate grade climb, it gives you more of a choice of what cadence you want to use so that if you like riding at a higher cadence or you just, you know, want to take it easy on your knees or, or your, your leg muscles. And, um, or, you know, let's say you're, let's say you're doing a long event and you're not really having a great day. You don't really have the energy to smash it up every hill. You want to just kind of, you know, go as easy as you possible go as easy as you can and still make it up the hill, then, you know, having the, the lower gearing helps with that. It gives you more options of cadence and for super steep hills, it might be, it might make or break your climb. You know, if, if you don't, if you're over geared to the point that you just, that let's say you, you can't even do, 50 RPMs, you're probably not going to make it up that climb. And so it could be the difference between walking up a climb and, and being able to complete it. And there's some steep climbs that we've been able to complete even with not, you know, the, the greatest power in the world. We were still able to get up those climbs riding them um, because of our gearing. And you don't have to necessarily, yeah, everyone's different. You know, it, it depends on cadence preference and also what kind of power you're doing. But what we've found that works well for us is uh, we have a, 
our gear ratio in our our smallest or our lowest our lowest gear is a 33 chain ring and 36 cassette so the you know the gear ratio is actually the cassette is bigger than the chain ring and when you, i think when you get into that type of a gear ratio you have a pretty that's a pretty easy gearing um yeah almost one to one it yeah. says it's 0.916 yeah gear ratio. so i think i think a one to one gear ra- ratio would be suitable for most people but if you really like to have the ability to spin on moderate grades then having a gear ratio that's a little bit less than one to one meaning that the cassette is the cassette is bigger than the chain than the small chain ring if you have that type of a situation then you have a lot of versatility on most climbs oh so i made a mistake about the gear ratio the lower the gear ratio is the higher the cadence you'll do so because what you would do is you divide the chain ring by the cassette so the smallest chain ring you have you divide that by the largest cog all right go ahead so basically if the gear ratio on your lowest gear is less than one to one then that's that's good you have plenty of uh of gears to to help you spin or make it up steep climbs and if your ratio is greater than one to one you might have some trouble you might be grinding unless you're a super strong rider yeah i i think you know it's it's either you if you know you you would have to spend some money if you decide to go this route and that's why i I love sram because the the electronic um, their electronic group set because it's just easy to swap these components out um so what we had to do was we got a new cassette and then we also got a new rear derailleur because the rear derailleur you need to have a long cage rear derailleur in order to be able to um get to the 30 is it 36 tooth cog um and the medium cage derailleur won't be able to do that so won't be able to handle that and you're going to get poor shifting so you do have to get a new rear derailleur and new cassette and it's not cheap i think it was i think the combination of the two was around 500 dollars um and the other option is you know do strength training right i mean i think strength training could help with you know grinding up steep climbs i don't know how much it'll help um, but that's a free way of, yeah, this, this might just be bro science. I don't really have evidence to support this, but my feeling has been in the past when the more strength training that I'm, th- that, that I'm doing at a particular point in the season, the more comfortable I am with grinding on a climb. So it, you know, that could just be. Um, in my head, I don't know if that's actually helping or not, but. So the, um, our gravel bike has a mountain bike cassette and a mountain bike rear derailleur. And again, that's why I love, that's what I love about the SRAM products is that everything is swappable as long as they, um, you know, as long as it's not interfering with the chain line. So my chain ring on the gravel bike is a 40 tooth, a single chain ring. And we have the 50 tooth cassette in the rear with the um, SRAM GX, I think, rear derailleur. So it's really helpful on those steep gravel climbs. And for mine hill, like I didn't even, I'm not sure if I was, there was some grinding involved, but it was, um, it wasn't like pure. I don't know if it's, I, I don't know, not sure if I'm saying this correctly, but it's not pure muscle. Um, but I didn't have to like muscle through, I guess, all of the climbs. I think it was just small parts of it. 
And I think that made a huge difference because it saved, you know, the, with a much lower gearing in the back, it kind of held me, helped me to spin out, spin a little bit more uh, on more gradual climbs. So if you're really struggling with climbing because, you know, it's on a steep roads, then yes, that would be a way to go is just look at your gear ratio. Yeah. And last point on that is just that it can, you know, if you're, if you're not competing and you just want to go out there and have some fun rides and you want to, to be able to ride on different terrain, having low gearing can just make your, your rides more enjoyable and, um, allow you to, to do different types of routes that you may not have done in the past because you were, you know, dreading going up certain hills or unable unable to ride on on the hills what's in your saddlebag so in my saddlebag are the basic tools that um that i think everyone should have for for any ride really uh, at a minimum i think i think you should carry a spare tube at least one spare tube um and some tire uh, tire levers also to go with it and you know obviously in case you need to to install that tube and a multi-tool that has various um what do you call the uh, the different like parts of a multi tool? Um, like different hex wrenches. Oh, wrenches. That's the word I was looking different for. Different size hex wrenches. To... Yeah. So in case you need to uh, to it's like it... adjust your seat, you know, just adjust your um, if you're like in a gravel on gravel and your um, handlebars loosen and they're dropping down you have you know the multi-tool to adjust that um yeah so something's wrong with your bike fit or if for some reason you need to take i mean if you if you need to uh take your wheel off um you know to change a tire for example um you know you need to make sure you have a a wrench that'll that you can use to tighten it back up afterward and I, I can't tell you how there are people who ride without these spare tools. And I don't know, <laughs> I don't know how they do it. I get so, I have such anxiety when I, if I ever get like a, a puncture, like by myself, it's like, I can change a flat on my own. But, you know, sometimes there's, it's not on, sometimes it's not easy to, and then the problem isn't clear cut. And you might come across other issues. And so um, not having anything, I think would just give me such anxiety. And I know it makes your bike heavier with all those stuff. And but it's like, you either have it or um, in my case, you know, obviously, I wasn't able to fix the issue that I had on my own. But if I didn't have an, a spare tube with me, then I I, I think at, at Vermont, I would have been done. Like, I don't think, you know, I don't think I would have been able to finish, finish the event. And we knew somebody who, uh, who did get a puncture, double puncture, actually, in one of the other events that we, we did and um, didn't carry, she didn't carry any tools with her and or spare tubes. And so she had to pretty much, uh, you know, pull out of that event. Yeah. So if you're, if you're doing a, a short race or something where you're just trying to maximize performance and you want to take the chance that, you know, if you get a, if, if it's, if it's the kind of event where if you get a flat and you have to stop to change it, your, your race is over anyway, then for something like that, you can do without these things and just take the chance. Uh, but you know, for normal riding purposes, highly recommended to 
have the ability to uh, to change a flat tire and you know, to have a multi-tool to fix you know a bike fit type of issue that may come up. And um, lastly, on the last piece of basic equipment related to changing a tire would be either a CO2 canister or a mini hand pump. Um, Joy carries the CO2. I carry a, a hand pump. I actually don't know what happened to that <laughs> CO2 cartridge. I don't know where I put it. So I've been riding without a CO2 or a, a pump. Well, yeah, but I guess you do have... <laughs> I, I should really you, start. I should really carry my own pump. I make Jason carry the pump. He has... You do have the, you do have the tubeless <laughs> tires, so there's the chance that if you get a puncture and you're out there on your own, it could seal... Um, you know, seal enough where you can get Yeah, there's home, enough sealant in the tires. I'm yeah. Just, I, um, I'm relying on that. Yeah, so that's why I... Goes against what I just said <laughs> five minutes ago. So part of the reason I carry the, the pump versus the CO2 is because it's... Um, it, you know, I'm just kind of a basic guy and, uh, you know, a pump is, uh, is just more basic to me. Um, you know, the CO2, I'm sure I could figure out how to use it if I had to, but, uh, it's, it's, it's always, I think, good to have a mini hand pump, especially if, if you're on a, like a really long ride and you just don't want to get stuck out there. Um, it might even be good to have both. You know, have a CO2 that you could use as your first option. And if for whatever reason that fails, then you have the hand pump to at least put some air, enough air in the tire to keep going. And I, we have a pretty decent, it's not even a, I don't know if it's a hand pump, but I don't, I'm calling it a frame pump because it fits, fits in your frame. Yeah. Well, I used to use a, I used to use a smaller hand pump and then now I'm using this, it's, it's a similar, it's a similar pump, but it's a mini pump, but it's, it's a little bigger, a little longer. And it's about the, it's roughly the length of my top tube and it fits right on the, the inside, like underneath, um, it fits like underneath the, the top tube on my, on my road bike. So I just, um, and it, it, Never mind. I was I was gonna say something stupid. <laughs> okay. Um, I was gonna say it might be making me more aero, just because like the average speed on my rides has been like increasing this year ever since I, and it's probably totally by coincidence that I happen to be using this uh, this frame pump. But I'm starting to wonder if maybe having that thing underneath my top tube is like making my bike more aero or something, but don't definitely don't go and get one for that purpose. Cause I have no idea if that's true or not. So that's it. Go out and get a silica frame pump. Everyone it makes you aero. <laughs> yeah, no, I did not say that. <laughs> you heard it from this podcast. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. If you enjoyed it, please follow, subscribe, rate, like, and so on to help this podcast grow. You can also follow us on Instagram, YouTube, and Strava. As always, don't forget to enjoy the rides.